Heavenly Father, today, at this time, we're spending time in your word, thinking about you and your calling for our lives. So make it obvious, make it clear, speak straight to our hearts so we can hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. The word of God in Hebrews says these words. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Isn't it cool that there's a race that each and every one of us has that is God-given, that's specific to you and your life, and we run this race keeping our eyes on the finish, that's Jesus. That's how we win at the race. There's the story this morning. It's in 1 Samuel. Here it is on the screen. It says this. Whatever Saul gave David to do, he did it, and did it well, so well that Saul put him in charge of his military operations. Everybody both the people in general and Saul's servants approved of and admired David's leadership. As they returned home after David had killed the Philistine, the women poured out of all the villages of Israel singing and dancing, welcoming King Saul with tambourines, festive songs, and lutes. In playful frolic, the women sang, Saul killed by the thousand, David by the ten thousand. This made Saul angry, very angry. He took it as a personal insult. He said, they credit David with 10,000s and me only with thousands. Before you know it, they'll be giving him the kingdom. From that moment on, Saul kept his eyes on David. Now you gotta see those two passages in parallel. The author of Hebrews says there's a race set before you, a specific race, a specific calling for you and your life only, and we run that race keeping our eyes on Jesus. And Saul, he lives this life as a leader who runs his race until he meets David, and from then on out, he lives his life looking at David. So often, Christians, humans, people that are breathing today, we struggle with the idea of contentment and comparison. It's just our nature to compare ourselves with others. And so often, instead of getting on our marks, ready for our race, instead we look next door to us to get on somebody else's mark in their race. When God calls us to our race and focus only on our race only. Now I know in our church, there are a lot of people that like to work out. Last week, we showed pictures of Pastor Juan and his giant muscles. No pictures today, folks. I know you guys like to work out because you post the pictures yourselves. Facebook, Instagram, yeah, we know you like to run or you like to sweat or whatever. You you go to the gym, it's cool, we all get it. But everybody, a lot of people like to work out. I don't actually like working out, but I like the endorphins after you work out. You feel like you've done something, accomplished something in your life, and you feel good about it. Now, there's one part of working out that I absolutely detest and it's running. Amen and amen, yes. I believe, and Oleg will disagree with me, I understand this, I I believe that running comes from the devil. It is a direct effect of the fall of mankind. See, Adam and Eve, they didn't have ellipticals and treadmills. There were no gyms in Genesis, right? And Adam was ripped. The guy had a six pack. Eve was a beauty as well, 0% body fat. You might say, Pastor Matt, where's your scripture for that? I got scripture for you. The Bible says very clearly, they were naked and unashamed. (laughs) You've gotta be ripped if you can be naked and be unashamed. I mean, honestly, I feel like calories only started counting once they ate the forbidden fruit, right? So for me to go running, it takes a lot of effort. Now, I know we have some runners here in our church. Um, Even this morning, Marvin Lohman, you might know Marvin, 
Uh, he and his wife, they, they run all the time. Sunday mornings, you'll find them out on the Seminole Wakaiva Trail. This morning, he gets up and, well, in first service, I said he ran three miles. He corrected me. He said, actually, it was 3.6 miles. <laughs> this morning, he went running. Um, Oleg, this guy's an Iron Man, half Iron Man, whatever. I mean, this guy does it. Oh, Jessica Marlia, you may or may not know her. She's one of our coaches over at Fleece. She is a beast runner. Like, she's ranked in the world in marathon running. She's so fast. She runs a marathon like every other weekend. She ran one, I think, two weekends ago, and she ran Boston a few, like, for the fifth time. She ran it just a few weeks before that. I mean, it's ridiculous. These people that love running. For me to run, it takes a lot of effort. In fact, I hate the fact that run rhymes with fun. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's not fun at all. There's nothing about running that's fun. In fact, I, I, I would even say that I hate running, but I do what I hate so that I can do what I love, which is to eat, because I love to eat. <laughs> to, for me to get on a treadmill, or some people call it the dreadmill, it takes a lot of effort. I've got to put on my Just Do It Nike shirt. I've got to wear a Lance Armstrong bracelet. I mean, he beat cancer. Maybe if I wear this, I can beat this jog I've got to do. Get on the treadmill, I got my, my headphones on, ready to go. Now some of y'all, you like to run with praise music. Lord, I lift your name on high. It doesn't do it for me, y'all. I can't even tell you what I listen to it because it's not appropriate to say it from the pulpit. But I do all that just to get on the treadmill. Once I'm on the treadmill, I think, okay, we can do this. Start going, moving along, I'm doing okay. Go for a little while and I think, man, I must have been running for 30 minutes. I look down, three minutes. Time slows down when you're on a treadmill. When you're running, it's just miserable. So when I'm at the gym sometimes, we don't have a gym membership here, but we've had one in the past. Uh, I, you get on the treadmill, and at whatever point, it's just absolutely miserable. Right before I start faking an asthma attack to get off the treadmill, I look to my right, and I look to my left to see if there's anyone else that's running on a treadmill next to me. And it's perfect when they're right next to me because then I can see their screen. And uh, in my head, I loudly say, Psh, you don't want none of this. And un unbeknownst to them, we have entered a race. They don't know it, but we are now racing each other. It's like two runners that are at the Olympics and the first person to get off the treadmill gets the silver and the last person to get off the treadmill gets the gold. And I'm gonna get the gold because I'm American and that's what we do is all we do is win, win, win. <laughs> so we're running, looking over. You gotta, gotta do it on the slide so they don't see you looking, although they're probably looking at mine too, right? And we're running along. If they're running at six, I'm running at 6.2, right? <laughs> if they speed up, I'm gonna speed up. If they go on an incline, I'm going on an incline. If they go on a break, you better believe I'm taking a break too. It's got to be fair. And once they get off the treadmill, I, sp I speed my treadmill up as fast as it will go because you got to sprint to the finish. And I grab my towel and in my head, I loudly say, I got the gold. It's funny when we talk about comparison when it comes to exercise. We can laugh about it. It's kind of funny. We can all relate to it. It's not as funny when we begin to think about comparison when it comes to real life situations. I have a question for you this morning. We'll put it on the screen here. It's this question. Who are you racing in life? Who in your life are you racing? Who do you have your eyes set on that if you could only beat them or if you can only be like them or if you can only be better than them, who is that? instead of keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus and doing what he's called you to do and running the race that he set before you. See, this morning I'm here to warn you and me too about the dangerous game of comparison. In fact, this morning, as before we move on from this treadmill idea, it's funny how when you're on a treadmill, you're sweating, you're breathing heavy, you're exerting a ton of energy, and you're not going anywhere. It's kind of the same metaphor, this analogy idea for life too, is we put a lot of energy and a lot of effort, psychological, financial, uh, physical effort to try and race someone else's race, but in the end, we're still in the same place than where we started. And I'm not talking at you this morning, I'm speaking with you because it's a struggle that everybody faces, everyone in this room and online, everybody faces this. Pastors aren't, um, we do it too. I mean, how many times do we say, well, how many members does your church have, right? What's your tithe this year? 
All these things. How good of a preacher are you? What are your leadership strengths like? Everybody struggles with comparison and wanting to be better than somebody else, yet God calls us to race the race that he's given you and the race he's given me. Everyone has an individual race. It's a calling from God just for us. And you know what? Comparison really comes from the devil. I mean, isn't that what got Lucifer kicked out of heaven? He's there and he says, hmm, look at God. I would like to be like the most high. And he leaves heaven because of it. Uh, In fact, I'll put it this way. Here it is on the screen. Comparison is a cancer to contentment. Did you hear me? I'm going to say it again. Say it again, preacher. Comparison is a cancer to contentment. It eats away at everything that you have good in your life because you're constantly comparing yourself to somebody else. It eats away at everything that's good and it leaves you empty. In fact, comparison will cloud the clarity on God's calling on your life. If you want to be confused on what God's calling you to do, start comparing yourself to somebody else. He's given you a unique calling that's only for you. It's your race. It's your calling that he set before you. And you realize that, um, that our calling is much different than our career, right? Because I could preach on this all day long. Our calling is 100% in most cases, in a lot of cases, maybe not every case, different than our career. In fact, let's put it like this way on the, on the screen. A career is something you get paid to do, but a calling is something you were made to do. Are you with me? Calling is so far beyond anything you could ever do or get money for. It's the core of who we are as disciples on God's mission. I was talking to Maureen this morning at in, in Connections Breakfast. We had a little conversation about this. It's so true that, that everything that we do is focused on mission. It, ha- it could, could have little to do with your career, but your calling has, is embedded in your DNA as a disciple of Jesus to go and live the gospel and bring others into the, a relationship with Jesus. Your career could have little to do with that or it could have a lot to do with it, but your career isn't necessarily your calling. Don't forget that. And the beautiful thing is, is that God gave you everything that you need to fulfill your calling already. Can I get an amen on that? I mean, look, if you needed to be taller, he would have made you taller. If you needed to be skinnier, he would have made you skinnier too. If if you needed to, to sing, he would have given you a voice. If you needed to have hair, can I get a witness, somebody? Stop complaining about the pieces that you didn't get from the master and start praising him that you're a masterpiece. In fact, Paul says it in Ephesians. He says this right here. For we are God's masterpiece. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. Man, God's called you for a special purpose that only you can fulfill in life. It's your calling, it's your race, it's your lane that he's given you. And we have such a hard time in accepting our calling and instead we spend half of our lives looking at everybody else and looking at what they're doing. Instead of just staying in our lane, fixing our eyes on Jesus and running the race that he's given us and following our calling, we're always looking at everyone else's and trying to get into their lane. When I moved to Florida about, whatever, five, six months ago, whatever it was, everybody always said, Matt, you gotta watch out for the traffic on I-4. And I'm sure it's much better now because the construction has helped a lot or it's, it's, it's lessened so there's a lot less traffic or it moves a little faster. But y'all, you haven't experienced traffic unless you've been in Atlanta. Oh my goodness. Whoo! Bumper to bumper, stop and go. And what I mean by that is more stopping than going. When I moved to Atlanta, I had a stick shift car. We got rid of that thing really quickly because you're sitting in traffic, You put it in gear, you drive forward one inch, and then you have to put the clutch in and put it in neutral again and wait for a five minute window. And then you you put it back in gear to drive one inch to pull it back out of gear. We got rid of that thing. Bumper to bumper, nonstop traffic. And and you're, you're like me because everyone is. When you're stuck in traffic, you start analyzing the different lanes. Okay, we've got two semi-trucks over there. We've got a record truck over here. We've got a, a, a Porsche over here and a Tesla over here. Okay. And then you start looking at what's happening around you and you look for the lane that starts to move first. Am I right? Okay, we all do this. Good. 
and you look in the rear view mirror and you look in the side mirror as that lane starts to go and you wait for the gap and you wait for the gap and when you see it, you mash the accelerator. That's a southern term if you don't know. You mash that accelerator down and you jerk the steering wheel and you whip your car, almost wrecking your car to get in the next lane to you. The problem is everyone else did that as well. So once you get there, the lane you were in now is moving faster, <laughs> right? And isn't that how our lives look too? I mean, we're, we're living uh, in our lane, yet we're looking in everybody else's lane, and as soon as that lane moves, we, we wreck our lives trying to get into somebody else's lane that doesn't get you there any faster than if you just stayed in your lane in the first place. And King Saul struggles with staying in his own lane. Don't get me wrong, King Saul was an amazing guy. I mean, the Bible describes him super, in, in big words, the Bible says that Saul was head and shoulders above the others. And one translation says that Saul was good looking, and you know you got it on if the Bible tells you you're good looking. <laughs> and so he's the king, and he's a good king, and he's doing well, but the problem starts when Saul, who is so incredibly blessed, he begins to look at David instead of keeping his eyes fixed on his own calling as a leader. And there's this other guy in the story, David, uh, just, a, just a sweet lad. His family sends him out to, to tend to the sheep, but he loves to be with his creator so much that he takes his harp with him. And so he goes and he sits out on the rocks and he takes care of the sheep and he, he sings praises to his creator God. One day he gets a text message from his parents saying he needs to take cheese sandwiches to his brothers down at the battlefield. So he goes down to the battle lines and when he gets there, he hears someone that's big enough to eat hay and he's dumb enough to eat it. And the guy is talking about his God in ways that are offensive to David. So David goes to the brook and he gets five smooth stones and he kills Goliath. And as Goliath falls down, David rises up. And David is propelled into notoriety and popularity across the land. He's being interviewed with ABC and NBC and CNN and Fox. I mean, he's trending on Facebook and Twitter. The youths of the day are watching the fight on YouTube. Did you see how he took down Goliath? They're watching it all. People are selling David action figures. I mean, it's an amazing thing. This young lad just slew the giant. David, is, his calling is so evident that everyone, the servants, the soldiers, everybody knows that he is going to be king one day. In fact, Jonathan, who's next in line to be king, takes off his royal robes and puts them on David because he sees the calling that God's put on David's life. And as David continues following his calling, Saul's gaze looks onto David instead of keeping his eyes on his lane. In fact, it pushes Saul over the edge when he hears these women singing that Saul has killed thousands, but David has killed 10,000s, and Saul can't take it anymore. He goes from running his race and looking at Jesus and staying in his lane to looking at David. And we, he becomes a case study of the downward spiral of someone that lives in the life of comparison. And you can hear it in Saul's speech as he says this. He says, you're going to give David credit for killing 10,000s, but me, you're only going to give credit for killing thousands. But me, that's comparison. But me. Maybe you know some but me people. There's a lot of but me people around there. Uh, there's, there's a lot of but me people in here this morning. Maybe you're watching online. Maybe you're a but me person. I don't know. It's kind of awkward, isn't it? You don't like me saying but me, do you? <laughs> I didn't say it. Saul said it. I'm just copying him. If you cannot celebrate the success of others, chances are you are a but me person. If you're stingy with your compliments and you think that lifting others up and complimenting them brings you down, you're probably a but me person. If there's anybody in your life that you secretly wish they would fail, you're probably a but me person. It's really easy to be a but me person, especially with social media. Y'all, we spend all day long looking at our phones and checking whatever, anything, well, you name it. TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. You're always looking, oh man, look at those shoes, look at that. Oh, that's what a happy family looks like, I see that. And we constantly look at everybody else trying to see what they have going on. I mean, you were stoked that you got a new 
a new Ford Focus until you saw that somebody else got a Ferrari. <laughs> you, you were excited because you got to go to the fun spot and then somebody else went to Magic Kingdom, right? I mean, that, that's, that's the world we live in and we turn Facebook and Instagram into a mirror and we say, mirror, mirror on Facebook. Tell me how I should look. Mirror, mirror on Instagram. Tell me who I really am. And instead of knowing who we are, called by God in a lane and a race that he's placed before us, we look around anywhere else but that lane to get input as to who we should be. Are these the cool shoes I should wear? Oh, not those. Is, is this what a marriage should look like? Come here, honey, give me a kiss so we can take a selfie and post it on Facebook. And we try so hard to run everybody else's race but the race that God's put right in front of us. He set before us. What race are you running this morning? Is it the race that God has outlined for you and you only? Are are you in the lane that he has given you or, or are you running somebody else's lane, somebody else's race? Are you comparing your marriage and your finances and your stuff and your your cars and your home to everybody else's? Are you comparing your talents and your abilities, your leadership, to somebody else? Are you busy looking at everyone else that you missed the incredible calling that God's put on your own life? Just the other day, I got to go to Defy Orlando. And if, you're, if you don't have any kids, it sounds like I went to some like rebellious nightclub in Orlando or something. Defy Orlando. It's a trampoline park, guys. Relax. <laughs> kids go there all the time and play. I got to go there with my kids. Caffrey, he's, he's almost nine. Kanan, he's almost seven. And we got to go down there. And there was a whole bunch of other fleece kids that were there too. 10 or 12 of them. It was awesome. We're down there. Uh, trampoline park. So there's a bunch of trampolines. There's foam pits. They got zip lines. They got obstacles you can climb on. There's a place you can play dodgeball and knock each other out and twist ankles and stuff. I mean, they were having a blast. Sweaty, rubbing up against strangers you don't even know. It's just gross, but the kids love it. And so we're there, they're having a good time. But there's this one place that is the coolest place in the whole place. It's a warped wall. And if you don't know what a warped wall is, you need to watch American Ninja Warrior once in a while. Because one of the obstacles in American Ninja Warrior is this 15 foot uh, concave wall that goes up to the top and there's coping along the top where you could race up the wall, grab the top of this, this wall and pull yourself up. And I would guarantee that there's probably uh, less than two people in this room that are, under the, that are over the age of 25 that can actually get up the warped wall. I've tried. Can't do it. I was talking to Richard Otati last night about it. He said the first time he tried, he ran smack into the wall. <laughs> it's, it's hard. So I got this, this group of 10 or 12, you know, nine-year-olds, eight-year-olds, seven-year-olds, and they're trying to get up this 15-foot wall. And let me tell you, some of these guys are just incredible. Like Pierce Jamerson, I don't know if you know this guy, He's, I think he's eight. I don't think he's nine yet. The dude can go right up the wall like, like no problem at all. Or Jackson um, Castell- Castellon. Ooh, how do I say his name? Mm-hmm, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. He just races to the top like it's no issue. And as I'm standing there watching the guys, um, I, I'm watching something happen. Two of the guys can get it every single time they try. The rest are really struggling. But as I'm sitting there watching... One by one, they start to figure it out. Some of the guys lean over the edge to help the others up, which I think is so cool that the culture in our school at Forest Lake Education Center is a anti-bully culture. Instead of tearing people down, it's doing whatever it takes to help people up. I see it all the time. And these guys, they're, they're helping each other up the warped wall to get to the top. And no matter how hard they try, there are some that are never going to make it up the wall, at least not on that day. And I'm standing there watching and I'm thinking, what's going to happen to the few that can't get up the wall, that won't get up the wall? Are they going to be so fixated on what others can do and what they can't do that it's going to ruin their day and ruin their jump fun? Or are they going to be so confident in who God has made them to be that they'll just continue right along. And as I watch these guys go, go at it, run up this wall, I'm proud to say that the kids in our church understand that they are who they are, who God has called them to be, that they aren't so focused on trying to be someone else or seeing what they are missing out on, that they can be confident in who God has made them to be. 
Listen, you will never be a good someone else. You'll never measure up to a calling of somebody else because God's called you to stay in your lane and to keep your eyes on Jesus. And he will do exceedingly and abundantly more than you could ever think or imagine as you keep your eyes on Jesus. Stay in your lane.